Okay, Andrea, thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. I just want to introduce myself. Um, my name is Andrea McCabe. Um, I am a member of the Delaware Nation. I'm sorry, I'm just a little bit emotional. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm a member of the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma. I am also a member of five other tribes. Could you name the tribes, please? Yes. Delaware, Caddo, Comanche, Kiowa, and Apache. Navajo. And Navajo, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd mention that. Um, what I wanted to do is I, I wanted to explain that I um, am a medical technologist. I work for the Indian Health Service. I have been a medical technologist for 12 years now. And um, that was kind of the reason why I chose this topic. So my topic is uh, challenges in the gay, lesbian, and transgender Native American, Native American community. So um, another reason why I chose this topic is because uh, in my daily work, I um, provide services to these patients, but I also am a friend of the community. And so I'm kind of aware of some of the issues that that um, go on in their community and, and some of the public health issues and risks that have been um, posed. So um, that's kind of one of the reasons, some of the reasons why I chose this topic. So let's see. Okay. So we'll just go over um, what's happening. Uh, Osama, please mute your mic. Okay, so the table of contents. In chapter one, I have the introduction, um, then I've listed some testimonies, um, public health challenges facing Native Americans, um, the high incidence of HIV infection among Native Americans. I address young men who have sex with men and HIV. Um, I address the strategies for addressing HIV in a school environment for young men who have sex with men. Um, discrimination in sports, discrimination in employment, discrimination of gender, and then I also added um, a section for my rationale of why I chose to do this work. Um, in chapter two, um, I talk about the two spirit people and what it is. Uh, chapter three, I just went over my methodology, the design of the interview guide, the institutional review board approval, the characteristics of the interview respondents, uh, challenges of getting agreement from the groups, and interviews with family members. Chapter four um, is the results. So I have several sections there. The discovery of sexual identity, family dynamics on the reservation, reasons for moving away from the reservation, challenge and opportunities of living in the city, uh, anonymity, uh, the gay bar culture, increased acceptability of homosexuality over time, social networking and reconstructing communities, STDs and HIV risks. Chapter 5 is the discussion of the concerns, uh, home life, violence, alcohol and drugs, family acceptance, confidence issues, tribal traditions, mental health issues, self-acceptance, suicide, and inadequate role of model and support. Chapter six is the conclusion and recommendations part of the paper. So I have recommendations to tribal communities, to the Indian Health Service, and also to urban programs. Then I have my references, which I'm still working on, uh, my acknowledgments, and then my appendixes, uh, the interview guide, the consent form, and the transcripts of my interviews. So that's what my paper will consist of. So I'm going to go ahead and read my abstract. Um, in, the the in this thesis, the public health challenges of Native American, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning individuals were studied to determine what causative factors contributed to the new cases of HIV and other STDs as well as what risky behaviors might have led to the new cases of infection. While HIV and STDs are the main factors that were studied, there were other factors that were also considered to include family dynamics, gay bar culture, violence, alcohol and drug use and abuse, the role of gay marriage, the impacts of social media and dating apps. 
The structured interview was developed to include questions about life on and off the reservation, family acceptance as a gay or transgender person, urban life versus reservation life, gay culture, gay bar culture, excuse me, attitudes related to casual sex and safe sex, knowledge of HIV and opinions about HIV. All 11 participants were men and they all reside in an urban city after relocating from a rural area or reservation. The results of the interviews demonstrated that all participants were raised in single family homes, they were subjected to some type of violence and grew up around alcohol and drugs. All the participants said that they always knew they were gay or transgender and had acceptance issues from their families. The attitudes regarding HIV and STDs ranged according to the age of the participant. In addition, interviews with four family members were of different LGBTQ were conducted to explore different perspectives. So some of the recommendations included the program should be developed with a collaboration of the Indian Health Service, tribes, the CDC, state and local government agencies to develop and implement effective HIV prevention and intervention programs for the Native American and Alaska Natives, LGBT community. They should also create programs and services specifically for the LGBT community and the tribal community as a whole to ensure a safe and non-judgmental environment for them to seek the services that they need. A further recommendation is to create HIV centers of excellence in all major IHS hospitals to, with a joint collaboration of state and local public health departments. And I've listed uh, the figures that I have um, in the paper. And then we will start with chapter one. <clears throat> so my introduction, uh, 1.1, um, I start with public health challenges facing Native Americans. Um, Native American and Alaska Natives face several challenges. HIV prevention, poverty, high rates of sexually transmitted infections, discrimination and discouragement from educational opportunities, stigma and suicide. Uh, discrimination is often felt by members of the LGBT community. Some of those activities that are, they are discriminated against include sports, jobs, and school. Some of the challenges that the LGBT, L, LGBT community face include getting help, with, getting help that is needed to prevent or spread HIV, hepatitis C, and other STDs, or the stigma that still surrounds Native American communities and reservations. Historical mistrust of service providers, personal trauma, um, perceived breach of confidentiality and access to services and lack of education are some of the reasons why um, there's been a problem with prevention and it's spreading. Um, some of the common threads that were observed and are, are always alcohol and drugs being used in the home, single parent homes and broken homes, feelings of inadequacy, not having any role models in the community to seek advice or help, and the fear of being of not being accepted or being abused for their choice, their lifestyle choice. And then I listed some testimonies um, from some LGBT community members. Um, this the first one is from a 31 year old transsexual female. It was a male, was female. Um, I came out when in mid mid November 2012, at the age of 29, a fully transitioned appearance was by the end of December. I had my name legally changed by the end of April 2013, and in November 2013, had also had the rest of my legal documents changed to female. I started hormones November 23rd, 2013, and will be eligible for surgery this November. Although my date for that is May 17, 2016, this journey has brought me a lot of happiness. But it isn't to say that life has been easy, because it has not. It's cost me some friends and family and just, just do not see to understand or even be willing to understand. Also, I've endured three suicide attempts, each worse than the one before. And it was at that point that the next time I wasn't going to fail, that I nearly didn't the third attempt. Changes like this, while we're liberating, are not always easy. I've been followed by people out of stores and catcalled on the streets and sexually assaulted in the bathroom. People ask, why do you make this choice? It isn't a choice. It's a matter of life or death. I've gotten off easy so far with negative experiences. 
Yet I make this choice to live instead of taking my own life. Why would someone choose a life that puts their life at risk even more? Why would someone choose to live in fear that they might be brutally beaten or murdered? Because life is precious, and I am here to make a stand and be proud of that I am a woman who is also a lesbian and happens to be transgender. I knew I was different from the age of five. Looking back now, I realized that I was born a girl. I'm going to die a girl. But for 29 years, I lived a life that was the equivalent of being a drag king. I did everything I could as a male, as I could not, as I could, as I could be, but who I was. This girl slash woman I am now just would not, could not go away. I would rather live my life as authentic as possible now as to go on living without something I am not. And I chose this quote to start because it actually encompasses a lot of some of the same feelings that transgender and um, gay, gay members of the community um, feel. And it also talks about a lot of the same struggles and commonalities that, that were also expressed in my interviews. And the next one is a short one. It says, my name is Philip. Uh, he's a member of the Winnie tribe. I came out to my parents in the middle of the night. I woke them up and said I have something to say. I am gay and I'm leaving to go and live my life. My parents did not understand and there was much disappointment for my parents. My mother cried and asked what she had done wrong and felt like she had failed. I ensured her that she had not failed, but it was just who I am. It took about eight to ten years before my mom accepted me. My mom had been battling cancer for many years and there was nothing left to do. She asked my sister to drive her to Portland. It was Christmas Eve and Paul and I were putting up our Christmas tree when, they came, when my mom came to visit. She said she came to check on me to see if I was okay. It was the biggest obstacle in my life was for my mom to accept me and she finally was okay with me. And then the next one is kind of a long quote, but it just um, talks about a, a two-spirit dance. And um, the individual that's, that's talking in this quote, she is considered a, a two-spirit person. And a lot of times in Native American culture, there are certain ceremonies and certain things that only men can do and that only men have the right to have knowledge of, and women are not. And so in this case, um, this, this transgender person identified as a male, but she was all, but she was a woman, a woman, and she was allowed to participate in some of these um, ceremonies that were for men only. And so this one is kind of long, so so I don't want to take time to read all of it. Um, it's, it's a tribe from Canada. Okay. I don't exactly know which tribe it was, um, but it, it's a tribe from Canada. So that's basically just um, the, the kind of the gist of, of this quote right here, but I thought it was interesting and, and it ties into the rest of um, the other quotes. So 1.3, the high incidence of HIV infection among Native Americans. Uh, Indian country, country is riddled with public health issues, with HIV and AIDS being on the forefront of those public health issues. Suicide, depression, alcoholism, and drug use are also among the top issues on Native American reservations for all Native Americans, both straight and the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning community. So let us consider some experiences. And then I... Um, inserted another quote from an uh, activist. He's considered an activist. He's from a member of the San Carlo tribe. His name is Isidore Boni. And he is also, um, he, he's a key supporter of the resolution recently passed with the San Carlos Apache tribe in support of the public health and safety code to include protections for HIV confidentiality uh, in, the tribe health, in the tribe's health code. In a recent Indian Country Today article, um, uh, Boney states that HIV disclosure is painful, not only for the individual, but for their families. This new code protects them. His advocacy worked in focusing on reducing the number of AIDS cases and reducing stigma within the Native American communities. He is an HIV and AIDS consultant for his tribe. He's a community ad ad advisory council member for the National Native American AIDS Prevention Center. 
According to the San Carlos Apache Tribe, HIV and AIDS Correlation Chair and the Public Health Emergency Prepared Preparedness Coordinator, um, Anita Brock, the implementation of such a code supports enforcement of public health responsibilities and the authority needed to identify the risk factors. So, um, as I, I kind of explained, the examples above are re my reasons for this research topic. Um, in each of the personal accounts, there was a different experience that was shared amongst the individuals. Um, one shared her account of what it was like to be a transgender woman in a physically male body. Another shared his account of the emotional sufferings he experienced as a result of being a two-spirit individual. The next, share, the next shared that it was meant for what it was meant for spirituality to be able to dance among men while he is a woman by gender. Lastly, an openly gay and HIV positive man displayed the courage and determination to fight for what he believed was needed for his tribes namely education and awareness about HIV and AIDS, as well as enhancing privacy for one status. So then, we, then I um, got some uh, statistics from the CDC about um, Native Americans and the population that have HIV. So um, compared to other racial groups, American Indians rank fifth in the estimated rate of HIV infection diagnosis in 2013, but rank higher than whites and Asian populations for the LGBT populations. What? <laughs> okay. In 2010, less than 1% of the estimated 47,500 new HIV infections in the U.S. were among American Indians and Alaska Natives. In 2013, those diagnosed with HIV, 78% were men and 22% were women. Of the estimated men diagnosed, 71% were male to male sexual contact. Of the estimated women diagnosed, the majority, or 69%, were through heterosexual contact. In 2013, in the USA, both male and female American Indian and Alaska Natives had the highest percentage of estimated diagnosis of HIV infection caused from IV drug use. Among men, 13% of new HIV diagnosis were due to inje in injection drug use. 6% were due to male to male sex and IV drug use. Among women, 29% of the new HIV diagnosis were due to HIV, or IV, sorry, were due to IV drug use. And so then I've attached this um, this figure one um, to show that information. And so then here's another figure um, for males um, showing the biggest part of the pie chart being men having sex with men and then the um, IV drug use and then men having sex with men and also the IV drug use. Figure two. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's I mean it's a it's, it's a large population there. And then for females, um, it shows that this that most of the their most of them contracted it through heterosexual contact or else um, IV drug use. So um, according to these two charts, um, males can engage in more risky behaviors than females. Yeah, that's because that goes with, I think, the culture yes. of slut shaming. Exactly. So in figure 1.4, I wanted to talk about young men who have sex with men and HIV because that's actually becoming more and more popular in the society that we live in today. Um, so in the younger population with ages 13 to 24 of age are among the most at risk for contracting HIV. 13? Yeah, they start at 13. Like with each other? Please don't tell me it's others. Like yeah, with, with young well, young men. So this chapter is young men who have sex with men. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so they're starting to experience at that age and they're not really um, safe about it. And so um, it says there, were, there was an estimated almost 48,000 newly diagnosed, diagnosed cases in the United States and they were among adolescents. In 2012, or 2011, among adolescent males ages 13 to 19 years, 
approximately 93% of all diagnosed HIV infections were male to male sexual contact. From 20, um, 2008 to 2011, um, young men having sex with men ages 13 to 24 had the greatest percentage increase in diagnosed HIV infections. And of that 26%, approximately 2% were American Indians or Alaskan Natives. And so this information right here is actually what sparked me to do my thesis over this, over this topic. is because um, working in the medical field, I actually see those numbers. Um, I'm actually the person that does those tests and can see that. And so it, 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 was, it was alarming to me. And so at that point, I was thinking, what, what can we do to... Um, how many tests on average were you like? We, we do lots and lots of HIV testing. Really? Yes. I mean, not, not just for males, but yeah. like for everyone. And, and I noticed that, you know, a lot of the new cases were um, young males. So, and the reason that I knew that they were probably homosexual is because of we, have, we do actually have an HIV Center of Excellence at my hospital. And we have two doctors that, that that's what they do. All of their patients are HIV positive, either newly infected or have, have a history. So, so if you are a, a patient of, one of either one of these doctors, then you automatically know that this patient is a positive patient. So then here is another, uh, in figure five, it uh, shows the diagnosis of HIV infection among men who have sex with men in ages 13 to 24 years uh, by race. So um, it shows in this, in this case that, um, that blacks have the highest, have the highest rate, and then um, whites and Hispanics were close, and Native Americans were actually the lowest. Um, the reason for some of the challenges in the HIV infection are many and not well understood. The differences are not distinguishable among individual races or ethnicities for risk infections as, as a result of risky behavior. Some of the possible challenges to explain the difference include the following. Um, inadequate education and in HIV prevention and intervention. So the sex education classes that they're having at schools are actually are not um, good enough. So we need to work yeah. on those. Um, so aware, and then they're unaware of the, um, that they're even infected. Because at that age, you don't really think about yeah. you could have, you know, you could have, you, I could possibly have HIV. Well, I mean, you're 13. <laughs> exactly. Gosh. It, it's really very scary. And then uh, the percentage of the risk. Um, they don't. They don't understand the impact that HIV can have on a person's life because they're basically just kind of starting out. So they don't. They don't see how it can impact your life, and it, they're really kind of selfish at that point because they're not thinking about anyone but themselves. And the use of alcohol and drugs is a big thing. Um, I think that you know that that's what the alcohol and methamphetamine are considered, um, or party drugs are commonly used among. Um, young men having sex with men, which increases the risk for risky sexual behavior. Uh, feelings of rejection, rejection and isolation, so family disapproval and disownment, bullying, harassing, uh, social isolation and sexual violence are things that young men having sex with men experience as part of their youth. These experiences lead to poor self-esteem, feelings of shame and regret, and can lead to depression, suicide attempts, substance abuse, and risky sexual behavior. And in 1.5, um, I've talked about some of the strategies for addressing HIV in a school environment. Um, so we want to look at the data collection. So we want to know, okay, um, what is the risk of the behavior um, of these children and where are they happening? And then most of these happen in large urban school districts. Um, so it's easier to monitor the health risks and uh, selected health outcomes among sexual minority students. Next, um, establishing a safe and supportive environment. So by addressing the challenges that surround uh, the young men having sex with men in HIV prevention, will be better received if they directly address the issues that are faced with every day in their school. For instance, bullying and verbal harassment as a result of their sexual orientation. Access to health services. So 
Leaking HIV testing and young men who have sex with men is essential to preventing the spread of HIV and AIDS. So we need to let them know that, you know, hey, you need to, we're going to give you access um, and it's going to be confidential, easy, it's going to be non-judgmental, it's going to be free. So all things that they may be, that they may, um, that they can, will help them to try and um, not spread the, the disease or actually get it. So we want to implement um, health sex education. So we want to provide relevant, evidence-based sex education to fit your population. So that, for in order for you to be successful. So m most schools' sex education programs consist of a basic, and I say vanilla education, because um, I think maybe on some level they don't want to encourage some of that behavior. So if they don't talk about it, but you know, kids are smart and they learn from each other. So they need to um, basically revamp their sex education they're getting at school. Yeah, especially. So, so, so I'm going to talk about some of the discrimination. So um, there's discriminations in sports, and um, sports are, are, they're very, are they're very important to Native American communities because a lot of times when you are on the reservation or in small communities, like that's all you have. Like, you know, you have basketball, you have football, you have track, whatever, whatever it is. And so that it's important to, to the families, and so they, they try to encourage that. And so they're often encouraged to play sports. They're more enthusiastic about the times about sports rather than they are about their academics. Um, straight men often feel uncomfortable playing sports um, with gay men. Just because as a part of American culture, if you're a straight man and you're too comfortable, you spend too much time with a gay man, then that that makes you gay by association. Mm -hmm. And so most straight men don't want to be termed gay if they're not. Mm -hmm. So I actually included a um, quote from a young man who had a best friend that was straight. And they grew up, their families knew each other, and they grew up together and his best friend was straight and he was gay. So um, he talked about like how he won in this quote about his experience about um, what happened to him um, as part of him being gay. And he said he never had any problems um, with playing on sports teams until about until junior high. And then he said, I was consistently called a homo, a fag, and a sissy. Some of our teammates would leave notes on my locker that said, fags must die. No home was allowed. My friend did his best to take up for me without becoming a target himself. He could not tell that our, I could tell that our relationship, our friendship was changing and I could feel my friend distancing himself from me. Eventually he told me that he really needed to focus on sports because that was the only way he was going to be able to go to college. He explained that he would always be my friend and didn't feel any differently towards me, but that he could not take the bullying he was getting from our other teammates. Mm -hmm. I could not believe what I was hearing, but in a strange way I understood. We never really interacted much after that, and he became a high school superstar and got a scholarship to play at a Division I school. So I, mean, I think this is a very real thing. I don't know how um, common it is for um, gay, individuals and straight individuals, whether it be male or female, to um, have these kinds of friendships because eventually if you don't have the same interests then you'll grow, grow apart. And, and, and I think that especially for males, like young males, they're, they're very childish. And yeah. so I'm sure that this bullying and this Even old ones are childish. Would, <laughs> what is, is a big issue. We still got Trump. So, uh, and also, you know, I, I talked about some discrimination in employment, and in, in this in this case, it's really about you know in, in the transgender community because while well, the mainstream society has become more tolerant of the transgender community, um, it's the curiosity of knowing that this person is a woman or this person is a man, but they look the opposite. So, like, and, and I'll be honest, even with myself. Sometimes if I know that someone is like a, a man but looks like he's dressed as a woman, I'm like, man, he looks, does this make it better than me? So, I mean, it's that kind of curiosity factor that um, I was really keeps bad them from getting those kinds of jobs that they want. I try not to, like, stare too much, too, but it's mostly because I'm, I, I'm thinking, like, gosh, they dress better than me. 
Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I think that's probably an issue, you know, like in professional settings like law offices and medical offices and financial institutions, um, the acceptance of a transgender appearance is not often tolerated because they don't fit into that norm of what they're expected to look like and it can make some of their clientele feel, um, feel uncomfortable, especially like the older, oh, the older people. Yeah. Um, and then discrimination of gender, uh, junior high and high school, gay age males experience some of the worst bullying and harassment due to their sexual orientation. And um, um, according to gay bullying statistics in 2005, the total U.S. population is from the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community. About one-fourth of all students from an elementary age through high school are the victims of bullying and harassment while on school property because of their race, ethnicity, gender, disability, religion, or sexual orientation. And uh, unfortunately, the primary reason for bullying is due to something that they may, that may set themselves apart from the norm and includes um, se their sexual orientation. And the Indian Health Service in 2011, um, in their behavioral health briefing book, said that 27.5% of Native youth in grades 6 through 12 experience bullying compared to 20.1% of students nationwide. Furthermore, 30.9% of Native students report in engaging in bullying behavior compared to 18.8% nationally. So that actually talks about each side, who's doing the bullying and who's receiving the bullying. And I think in part, um, social media is, is the most common tool for doing the bullying because it's easy, Every, almost all teenagers have access to social media. Um, it's it's easy. easy to disassociate themselves too. Exactly, you know, it, it, it helps them um, connect with their friends and family or broadcast information quickly. It's easy to bully people because you can deem yourself anonymous. And so cyberbullying has become a popular way to harass individuals and also has the largest impact in terms of emotional damage often leading to suicide con um, contemplation. Can, I mean, I don't know if this is a part of, if you found anything, is there any results or any effects of the PTSD possibly? Um, I didn't actually um, research that, but I'm sure that there are. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that there are. Um, and then 1.9 is, is my rationale, which I kind of explained a little bit earlier, um, that the new cases of HIV and STD-related illnesses among the LGBT community um, in particular are important because they're a leading source of mortality and morbidity and the effective life values of the whole community. And as an employee in the healthcare field, you know, I, I see this all the time, and I want to figure out why, why are there so many cases of young people being infected with HIV, um, hepatitis C, or other STDs, um, could it be the laws of attitude of the young gay males that it won't happen to me, it won't happen on the first time, or it doesn't matter, there are drugs for that. And I will take my chances, it's not the same without condoms. So these are deeper and more far-reaching issues to consider. And upon, re upon researching, there are many other factors that contribute to the risky behaviors of the LGBT community. And some of those factors are home life, violence, alcohol and drugs, Confidence issues, family acceptance, tribal traditions, mental health issues, self acceptance, and ethical laws. So, one thing I wanted to mention was that um, while research um, includes discussions from data of all tribes in the United States, most of the data that was actually collected through my interviews was primarily um, from amongst the Navajo tribe, whose reservation encompasses Utah, Arizona, Colorado, and New Mexico. Okay, so chapter two is um, the two spirit people. So there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about two spirit people. There's been a lot of books written about it, and um, a lot of gay people um, or transgender people will refer to themselves as two spirit people. And this is a picture that I found of a two spirit person. So. I wanted to, um, to to give the Wiki, the Wikipedia definition of two spirit, and then I also wanted to give the Native American definition or how how natives use the term. Um, so according to Wikipedia, it, the two spirit is defined as a modern umbrella term used by some indigenous North Americans and gender fiber individuals in their communities. The term was adopted in 1990 as an indigenous, lesbian, and gay international 
international gathering to encourage the replacement of the anthropological term for death. It's a spiritual role that is recognized and confirmed by the two spirits indigenous communities. While some have found the term useful for in intertribal organizing, not all native cultures conceptualize gender or sexuality this way, and most tribes have names in their own language for um, gay individuals. So universally, it's not used universally or consistently across Native American communities. So here's another um, picture of a two-spirit person dressed in a traditional female regalia. So, which you can. So two-spirited or two-spirit usually indicates that a native person who feels their body simultaneously manifest both a masculine and feminine spirit or a different balance of masculine and feminine characteristics that are usually seen in a masculine men and feminine women. Most indigenous communities have specific terms for, in their own languages for the gender environment members of their communities. And so I've listed some of these some of the terms, um, I don't want to pronounce them wrong, so I won't, um, I won't pronounce them. <laughs> I know one of them, but some of them I, I don't know all of them. And so I, um, this term, this next section is from an author of The Two-Spirit um, and the Flesh, and it was from a professor of anthropology and history from the University of Southern California, and he just talks about um, the two-spirit person, so rather than emphasizing the homosexuality of these persons, however, many Native Americans focus on their spiritual gifts. American Indian traditionalists, even today, tend to see a person's basic character as a reflection of their spirit. Since everyone that exists is thought to come from the spirit world, androgynous or gender persons are seen as doubly blessed, having both the spirit of a man and the spirit of a woman. Thus, they are honored for having two spirits and are seen as more spiritually gifted than the typical masculine male or feminine female. And that actually doesn't seem to be um, the, not everyone agrees with that, with that, with this reasoning. But it does stand the reason. And so I included some uh, modern pictures of two spirit individuals um, that I got from an article in Indian Country Today. And so it shows these two males dressed in traditional uh, female clothing. Quote, so they're, they're, they're trying to break the, the stigma of the two-spirit people, showing that, it, that it's okay. <coughs> but honestly, if, if these two people were to show up at a powwow like this, it would not be, oh, it, would be it would not be accepted they would probably be forced to leave. <laughs> you know, um, when I worked in Salt Lake, there was a little girl, she was a two-spirited little girl, and she was a part of the um, little tribe with many feathers there, and they actually, uh, she grass danced. Oh, really? Yeah, she would grass as dance a boy. as a boy. And in some of the tribe, they, they always had a powwow that they did, that they put on, and, and they would let her dance as a boy. Because only boys do grass dancing. Yeah. Sorry, that was a random thing. That was fine. It would wait. So in chapter three, I want to talk about real quick about the methodology. So the design of the interview guide, um, I designed this interview guide based on questions I thought that would help with, um, would generate answers that would help with my research. And so there are questions about tribes and um, reservation, living on and off the reservation, sexual orientation, um, there's some questions about gay bars and gay events, um, questions about sexual promiscuity, um, taboos, <coughs> family acceptance, um, and then also there's some questions about um, HIV and AIDS. So this is also included in the appendix. So then the next is the, in the um, IRB, the Structured Interview Guide, um, and the informed consent guide were approved by the AUSN IRB. And some of the challenges for getting agreement from the groups, it was really hard for me to get people to do my interviews. Um, one of the main challenges was um, them signing the consent form. They didn't want to sign the consent form. 
they they wanted they were some of them were willing to talk to me, but they were not they did not want to sign that consent form because they thought that um, it was going to be it was going to be used um, that was going to expose them, I guess. And I explained to them that you know it's going to be totally anonymous unless you choose to have your name in there. I'm not going to um, breach your confidence. I'm not going to you know do that, but. But I think it, it was because um, of the, the past uh, experience and with Native Americans that, um, like, like kind of what Lodge was talking about, that you, know, you, you don't want to sign something unless you actually know like, what it's going to be used for and, and it could be used in, in an in a inappropriate way. And that may be um, one of the reasons why they didn't want didn't to sign it. In fact, I think it probably was the main reason why they didn't want to sign it. And um, while I'm a friend of the community, I have several gay friends, and I'm familiar with many of their stories and life experiences, but however, they're unwilling to participate in my structured interview. So, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure why. Um, they did say, some of them did say that I was welcome to use their stories, um, because I do know them, per, do you know their stories personally, and, but they did not want to take the interview. So um, some of the characteristics of the um, interview respondents, um, I actually only get was able to get 11 people that were willing to actually take the interview. Um, so I had to kind of rely on my friends' own experiences and then also from um, some conferences that I had gone to and to take from that as well. So I, I mean, I understand that my sample size is, is, is small, but I, I, I had some some difficulties in getting these interviews. So um, eight of these eight of the eleven men were biologically um, male, and three were transgender. And the ages of the respondents ranged from 17 to 47 years of age. And then I listed out right here the ages of the people <coughs> who took the interview. And all of the respondents currently live in in a city. And then I had uh, some interviews with family members that I was able to uh, to to get. There's um, what they call a P flag support group through the Native Connections um, in Phoenix, and they have um, a meeting for families every third Saturday, and they talk about um, you know issues with surrounding their their gay family member. You know, daughter, son, cousin, whatever. And then I just included some pictures. Um, this is a transgender male, um, probably at one of the events. And then this is a picture of uh, two spirits showing the, the male and the female together. And in chapter four, this is the results. So this is basically the, um, the meat of the thesis, if you will. So the discovery of sexual identity, um, 10 out of the 11 individuals that were interviewed admitted that they always knew that they were gay or they were different. Some knew from a very young age that they were gay or transgender. Um, one interview called, um, recalled being attracted to his mother's clothing and fascinated with hair products and makeup. She, as he refers to himself, wanted to be free to express herself in public in women's clothing and with makeup on. She knew that she would not be accepted at school or in other social studies outside the home, so she became closeted and pretended to be what the world saw her as a male. She concealed her identity until she was able to leave the home and be in her own, on her own and be able to express herself. So one of the other interviews, so one of the other interviews recalled that he always knew he was gay. Um, he wanted to play with the girls and dress up and play tea parties and dolls and with his cousins and he wanted to wear girly colors and patterns. He said that he was always most comfortable being with and around females because that's how he identified himself. When he was in a group of males he ex experienced was one of attraction and um, attraction and uneasiness for fear that they would be he would be found out because not many outside of his family and close friends knew that he was gay. One particular memory he shared was being in the locker room filled with the naked or half-naked men and recalling that it was the first time he remembers feeling lust. He had a difficult time looking away for fear that he would be found out. From that experience, he was always looking for chances to be with or around naked men. 
So in another in another interview, um, uh, he he um, an interview recalls thinking that that um, he was gay, but tried to fight the fact that he knew that his family knew, and they would not accept it. He grew up in a family of males that were athletes. His father and brothers would make demeaning comments about faggots and queers. He knew that if he showed any sign of being gay, that he would, he would do, they would do the same to him. So he kept his true feelings to himself, and it caused him to become introverted and lead to a down a path of drugs, drug use. So another interview had a very much a, a much different experience. His truth, as he calls it, actually set him free. He grew up with sisters and in a single parent home. He always knew that he was different. He knew he was a boy that felt like a girl inside and wanted to be a girl. He struggled with that, with what to do and who to tell. He was alone in his room and he would take his sister's clothes and put them on and pretend he was a girl and play house. When he got a little older, he felt like he needed to tell his mom because he felt like he was living a lie and wanted to be true to himself. So he asked to have a conversation with her. He was very nervous, but just blurted out he wanted to be a girl. His mom said she already knew, and so did his sisters. They were just waiting for, for him to tell them. So he actually had the support he needed once he actually was able to, to come out. But many of the individuals that were interviewed had very similar experiences about identifying with their sexual identity at a very early age. So 4.2 family dynamics on the reservation. So um, basically all the all of the, inter the interviewees, 100% of the people interviewed came from single parent families or broken families where either one or both their parents drank alcohol, did drugs, or they had been subjected to some type of violence. And question number 13 from the interview uh, regarding family support, and question 19, which asks about negative experiences, um, where it asks to address these topics. And most of the interviewees had similar experiences with alcohol and drugs being present in the home most of their lives, and they, some of, and they went over some of their experiences. So uh, most of them, you, you, I'm not going to read all of them, so you don't have time to, but um, basically, you know, the, the dad or the mom drank, mostly the dad, the dad would leave, um, be gone, um, and they would have, uh, be stay at, they'd be left at home. Um, they, in this case, this interviewee, this individual, um, his parents would drink together at the house and they would smoke weed and he would just stay in his room because he didn't want to be around it. And then he would wake up and he would find people that he didn't know um, in his house, sleeping everywhere, passed out, whatever, and um, he would be scared, um, but he, he, he didn't know what to do. He, he seemed like, he, he said he felt like everyone, everyone drank, and that, you know, it was just, he said, I remember when I was under 10 that, that he started drinking. He said it was no biggie. My dad's friends would give me beers or ask me if I wanted to take shots. They would laugh and punch me and say, um, it'll make you a man, and then everyone would laugh. And then there was always random people laying all over the floor in the house. We'd wake up from the night before. And so it seemed like alcohol and drugs seemed to be always a part of, of their lives. And they always came from single parent homes, mostly they lived with their, with their mom. Um, this guy, this interview, Jackson, he said that, you know, he, he, was, he, was, he was little when his dad left. And his mom had to support him. She was a bartender. She worked at a bar, so she always had like different boyfriends all the time. And then he would, you know, see meet different people all the time. So for him, it was kind of like not a big deal. Oh well, it's, it's who is it this week kind of thing. So, um, but he, um, his mom just told his dad to leave. That he was better off. That they were better off without him around. And so this, this is this type of thing just gets over and over. I mean, of course, there there are different experiences. Um, yeah. for yeah. In individuals, but overall, it, it's it's the theme that you know that's throughout um, common the, the common thread. Yeah. So, and it also because you grew up like that, it also um, a lot of a lot of them also drank and became abusers of alcohol and drugs themselves. 
So um, some of the reasons for moving away from the reservation, um, a lot of them, some of the common reasons interviews gave for leaving the reservation was wanting, was wanting to leave is because of their family's unwillingness to accept their life, their life choices, or having access to other LGBT individuals. Um, so you know they they would leave at the as soon as they could you know get get a chance to leave and they wanted to be off the res and be with people like them and want to live their life and not be judged and um, that that was basically the main reason. So these are just different accounts of, of reasons why um, people want to leave. Uh, challenges and opportunities for living in the city. Uh, while there are challenges in living in the city, for most, for most, the opportunities outweigh the challenges. Um, for many of the interviewees, they expressed having a better overall quality of life living in the city versus the reservation or rural areas. Some of the challenges of making the transition were not knowing anyone or having family around to stay with for support, not being able to find a job right away, being too involved into the party scene, and finding a niche. However, on the other side, the opportunities outweigh the challenges, which is why um, that they decided to stay in the city. So they were able to, to go to school, um, they were able to find work, there was more resources for them to go and find, to find work or go to school, and ways to pay for them, the public transportation for them to get around if they didn't have a car, um, more opportunity to network easier to find other LGBTQ members and access to health care, ability to live a life free of judgment and mourning, and there are more places for entertainment, and ability to be involved in, in their community and movement activities. And so next, um, anonymity. Um, so that was another reason why people wanted to move away from the reservation is because they wanted to do what they wanted to do, and they didn't want other people to know that they were gay or that they associated um, with certain groups, and so then they wanted to move away so they could, you know, live their life. And so um, they wanted, you know, this this interview so that he wanted to come to the valley, which is here in Phoenix, and where no one or no one knew me or anything about me. I would go to Pride and meet new friends and be in an environment where others were like me, and no one was judging me for my decisions or lifestyle. I had an opportunity to meet other native queens. I like being in the valley, but knew that I could not live here because I had to take care of my family back on the res. But I had fun while I could. <laughs> so, you know, like in this case, um, this interviewee had new people that lived um, in Dallas, Texas, and he wanted to leave. So, he his thing was he did he wanted someone to take care of him because he basically was taking care of his family. And so he wanted someone to take care of him. He wanted someone, as, as they call the gay community, he wanted to be kept. So he wanted someone. It would be the equivalent of an older man with a lot of money having a young, a young girlfriend. Like a sugar daddy. Yeah, basically. Yes, they, that's the equivalent of that. So he went to um, he went to Dallas to be with his friends, um, so he could go away. And he actually ended up getting. Um, he actually ended up. And doing escort work and be and work being like a stripper because he wanted to go to school and he couldn't it didn't happen for him right away so uh, and he never would have made that decision um, if if he knew that there was anyone that might know him but you know Dallas Texas is far away from the reservation so I mean of course it's a small world and we all know people but um, that was his, basically you know what he had to do so he it, he did and this is probably the most interesting. Um, experience that um, was told to me from someone about anonymity. Um, he was a, he was actually the oldest interviewee. Um, he had, he, had won, he was well established in his career and well respected in his community. He was intrigued with drag queens and he was interested in doing drag shows. So he had younger friends that already were performing um, drag at some of the local bars um, in one of the towns that he lived. Um, and so he decided that they had amateur night one night, so he decided he was going to do it. And so his drag his drag name was Mini Turquoise. <laughs> <laughs> That's the drag name that he chose for himself. <laughs> so his, his first experience he said was was fun and entertaining, and that he became a regular part of the drag show. 
And he says, being a drag allowed me to let loose and just have fun. It took me to a different place where I could act out how I wish I could be. I have a stressful and demanding career, and, and the shows allowed an outlet for me to relax. I made sure that no one I knew or might know found out about my favorite hobby. So the allure of anonymity oftentimes led to behaviors and practices that were risky at best, and risk, risk is a part of the gay lifestyle of the Yay. culture. So the next we want to talk about the gay bar culture, which actually is like um, is the epitome of, of gay lifestyle. Um, that's where they have, you know, basically anything goes there. So they have um, different categories of gay men. Um, so they have what's called a twink, and they're young, skinny, 20-somethings, and they basically think that the world revolves around them, and they have everything <laughs> And the other, then the next group is called twunks, and basically they're twinks <laughs> with muscles. So twinks are skinny, and they fit twinks, like a certain twinks, profile, twinks. and then twunks are actually the same as twinks, but they have muscles. And then there's there's bears. They're generally older gay men that embrace their hair and hairiness. Wow. <laughs> and then they also have another category called cubs, and they fit basically like just their younger version of bears. Oh. And then they have what are called chasers, and um, they're men that are generally not overweight, but seek partners that are. Hmm. Um, and each of these categories have their own specialty bars. If you go like to some of the bigger cities, like you know, to LA, to Denver, to even here, they have like you know, say, oh well, that's a you know, that's a bar, the tweak bar, oh. or that's a chaser bar. Or that's a you know a lesbian bar. You know they they are actually specific bars in in the gay community. So if that's what you like, if you're if you're into bears, then you go there. Or, or leathers, they call them sometimes. Then that's where you want to go. You want to go there because yeah. that's that's where they hang out. That's too much information. So <laughs> so you know basically you know that's they have you know yeah. at the gay bars they they always they always always have some kind of entertainment whether it be a drag show, a strip show, some kind of event. They always have drink specials that are easy. You know, they want to get everyone drunk because that basically people start to have a good time. That's um, cool. You can basically get um, drugs there. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff that goes on in gay bars. A lot of people bite. Um, appall that. I know that as a straight woman going to gay bars with my friends, um, I've been appalled by some of the I heard that it's pretty crazy. It is. It's a you do anything you want to do. <laughs> so uh, in 4.7, um, well, I'm going to talk about increased accept acceptability of homosexuality over homosexuality over time. Um, since the 70s and 80s, the acceptance of homosexuality has become more socially accepted, and there is an increased recognition of the gay culture and populations. With the Obama administration promoting gay marriage and the 2015 Supreme Court decision to legalize gay marriage, it has put an increased spotlight on equality and the right to choose. It has made accepting homosexuality more tolerable and with the help of mainstream media, more open-minded to the gay marriage concept. While there is still a large majority of the population that will never accept gay marriage or gay culture in general, there are just as many that support it and believe in equal in social equality. Slowly, mainstream media has worked the gay culture into popular TV shows. Re in reality TV, specifically displaying gay rel relationships and openly gay displays of affection. Um, our pop culture makes things easier to accept if celebrities either endorse or participate in a trending behavior or fad. While being gay is not a new thing, nor is it a fad, it is a fad to be curious and deem oneself bisexual or questioning. And then uh, social networking and constructing communi uh, communities. So with the social networks like Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, we're all familiar with those. Um, we probably all use those on a daily basis. Um, there's specific um, dating apps for specifically for um, the LGBT community, Grindr, Hornet, Jacked, and Tinder. Make it easy to find connections for our hookup Dang. fast and easy. Um, the dating apps within the there's the, more than Tinder. <laughs> oh, there's a lot more. And so the apps and social networks are free, can be accessed on any smartphone, tablet, or computer from anywhere. 
Um, there were no direct questions in my interview about um, social networking, but a few of the individuals mentioned that these apps, mentioned the apps during their interviews, because I, I never heard of Jax or Hornet, but I knew about Grindr and Tinder, but I didn't know about the other ones, so. So, um, in 4.9, I'm um, talking about um, STDs and HIV risks. So, while with the increased use of social media and dating apps, the risk of contracting an STD or HIV also increases. Um, in conducting interviews, I found that majority of the younger population were more apt to use, more apt to take the most risks. While those interviewees that were older had been in the community longer, were more cautious than and not willing to take as many risks. So, and then there's some quotes from from the interviews that I um, that I did about casual sex, um, having you know, how important is it for you to have safe sex, safe sex every time? And I got three different responses. Like one said, I already knew when I went out that I was going to hook up. I never it never really crossed my mind that I was going to that I could be doing something dangerous. Um, when you're in the moment and you're drunk, you don't take the time to remember a rubber. You just do it and hope that you don't get anything. Um, I like casual sex. I can get what I want with no ties or expectations. To me, it's better. Sex is good. I want it often with different men so I can have a different experience. If the other person wants to use protection, then okay, but I don't offer. We are all going to die from something. I will take my chances. I want to, I want to die happy doing what I want on my terms. Wow. How was that one? It was, he was 17. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> she was so like, yeah, she, yeah. See, she, she knows. So there's kind of, you know, we can kind of guess, like, what age these people are from. And then the last one, uh, or the next one, it's important for me to have a safe encounter every time. I don't want to contract HIV and Hep C. I got tested often, and I know my status. I usually carry my own protection, but if I forget, most of the bars have free condoms, and I'm glad they're promoting safe sex. Yes. And that, and this is from someone that's older. <laughs> a bear. Yeah. A bear. <laughs> No, <laughs> so I mean, they, I mean, they are aware of it. I mean, I know that they're that you know every at every gay event, um, at the pride celebrations, at the gay bars, wherever they always have um, information posters or whatever about S, uh, STDs, HIV, know your status. They have a lot of them have hard hats with um, uh, free condoms available, and they have information there. You know, like free testing. So I mean, I, it's there. They they put it out there. Um, so in chapter five, I'm going to talk about the discussions of concerns. So home life. Um, one of the more common themes um, is that you know we have already talked about this. Most of the people came from broken homes, single parent homes where the mother was the only provider supporting a family with multiple children, an absentee father, and almost.